a daily basis to work with um, one of the most steadfast investigators of this culture, high and low, uh, in New Orleans for the last 20 years, the executive editor of Louisiana Cultural Vistas. I'm going to turn it over to him now, uh, Mr. David Johnson. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. And um, since we do are calling this series The Arrivals, I should say I count myself as an arrival. Um, I arrived in New Orleans 21 years ago uh, to take this job, and I've been happily ever after. Um, I would say, um, of course, moving here comes with many joys, but also many perils, as most of us can relate to. I became immediately thankful for the invention of air conditioning hmm. <laughs> and the uh, availability to purchase uh, DEET and Deep Woods Off, uh, which I know many of my uh, previous arrivals here were not able to do. In fact, uh, in preparation for this uh, series, I was reminded that many of the earliest settlers here in our city were convicts uh, who were shipped over from France, uh, often uh, not willingly. Uh, in fact, uh, during that period at the Bastille, there was actually a riot uh, when the prisoners were told that they could get manumission in exchange for settling here at the uh, mouth of the Mississippi River. And as my executive, Michael, Director Michael Sartiski, was uh, prone to point out, that may have been the first ever hell no, we won't go <laughs> protest uh, to, to occur. But uh, anyway, I'm glad to be here, and I'm certain that our uh, panelists are as well, so I'm going to introduce each of them. Uh, immediately to my right is Dr. Raphael Casimir. He's been a member of the History Department of the University of New Orleans since 1971, and he presently holds the rank of Professor Emeritus. Dr. Casimir has been active in the NAACP since 1960, and he's held many elected offices within that organization, and he has served on the Board of Directors of the Crisis Publishing Company, the official journal of the national NAACP. He is the author of African Americans in New Orleans Before the Civil War. And sitting next to him is Dr. Emily Clark. She is the Clement Chambers Benenson Professor of American Colonial History and Associate Professor of History at Tulane University. She is the author of such books as Masterless Mistresses, The New Orleans Ursulines, and The Development of a New World Society, 1727 to 1834. And most recently, she wrote The Strange History of, American, of the American Quadroon, Free Women, Free Women of Color in the Revolutionary Atlantic World. And finally, we have Dr. Lawrence Powell. He holds the James H. Clark Endowed Chair in American Civilization and is the director of the New Orleans Center for the Gulf South at Tulane University. He's also a former board member of the LEH, and he's the author of such books as Troubled Memory, Ann Levy, The Holocaust, and David Duke's Louisiana, mm -hmm. New Masters, Northern Planners During the Civil War and Reconstruction, and most recently, The Accidental City, Improvising New Orleans. So as you can tell, we have quite a, quite a brain trust up here this evening, and I'm going to try to be as minimal as possible to give you all as much time to speak. Um, we all know we're approaching the 300th anniversary of uh, New Orleans establishment in 1718. Uh, it was founded by the French Mississippi Company under the direction of Jean-Baptiste Lemoyne de Bienville. So I want to open it, this uh, conversation up by asking, why here? Why was New Orleans settled? And I know, uh, Larry, you've addressed quite a bit of that in your book, so let's begin. <coughs> well, first let me... Uh, correct the record, I'm, I'm retired, so I'm now an emeritus professor and the former holder of those positions, so. I'm the only one still working. <laughs> <laughs> Your web, the website needs to be updated. You're the only one who's working for pay. Yeah, we're still working. Um, you know, I, I claim it was an accident in the sense that there was a strong uh, strong element both in Paris and in Biloxi uh, where the two boards of the Company of the Indies were uh, located for keeping the capital and headquarters of the Company of Indi the Indies either in Biloxi or moving it up to Natchez or Bayou Manchac and I think but for the uh, the uh, Mississippi bubble, which is one of the first stock market crashes in world history, it's not, not the first, the tulip mania was the first actually, uh, 
I don't think the capital, the headquarters of New Orleans would, would have been cited here. I think something would have been cited here. And so I kind of tell that story. I don't want to go into the details of it. It gets kind of involved. But uh, that's why I called it an accident. Uh, but if a city was going to be placed close to the mouth of the river, it would be here. And I think Rich Campanella has made that point uh, emphatically and convincingly. Uh, and let me also say that I think it would have been a mistake for the capital to move, for New Orleans to be placed upriver, especially in the, in the vicinity of the environs of Baton Rouge, because I think it would have allowed the populations, the very mixed populations that came to compose this city uh, to uh, uh, kind of spiral out into their own separate ethnic enclave, and we wouldn't have had that kind of compact ethnic pressures cooker that we had here for so many years, and I'm not sure that culturally New Orleans as we know it would have evolved. Uh, but that's, uh, that's my answer to that question. <laughs> So um, following the 1718 founding, who were the first arrivals? What kind of settlers were coming here? And I'll open that up to, um, to all of you. Who were, who were these daring people to uh, strike a new life can in I, the swamps? Can I sort of add to yes. what Larry was talking about before we go to that? Um, I'm going to pull the camera back or go up to about 30,000 feet and talk not just about this specific place, but why the French came over here. And they kind of got into the game late. They started in the 16th century and tried to, uh, to colonize the Carolinas, actually, in Florida. And they failed. They were run off by the Spanish. And then they had these terrible religious wars, and so they were sort of out of the picture for a while. But they wanted to be part of the Atlantic economy um, that was uh, the motor of which was pl the plantation slave labor economy with which I'm sure we're all familiar. And so when they were ready to gear up again for making a stab at creating a presence in, in North America, um, this was the place, this was the logical part of the continent for them to come to. And so they did need to be at the mouth of the river. But I think um, it's interesting to think about why the French ended up in the middle of the country and what that meant for New Orleans and also on the Gulf Coast and what that meant for New Orleans and for the people who, who came here. It had a, a huge, tremendous um, influence on us. So I'll let somebody else talk about who came in 1718. Okay, I will go. Uh, as Emily mentioned, the French really got started late, but they had already had an early settlement in Canada. And when uh, Louis uh, Marquette and Juliet found the Mississippi River, De La Salle tr traveled all the way down here in 1682 and claimed this part of the Mississippi River Valley for France. They had a long ways from France trying to get people to come here. And in fact, by the time uh, Iberville and Bienville came in 1699, they came with a whole lot of men which is a hard way to repopulate the population. <laughs> and most of these men were not the kind of men that you needed to do farm labor. A lot of them were fishermen. A lot of them had come over here looking for quick riches and so forth. But by the time New Orleans uh, was founded in 1718, you already had a few scattered settlements in uh, uh, Biloxi and Mobile. Uh, just recently, they had opened a settlement in Natchitoches on the western part of the state. But Bienville, who was the governor, in fact, had been governor for a long time, did not really see eye to eye with John Law by creating a large uh, population that would interfere with his trade with the Indians. And so part of uh, John Law's plan was to quickly settle Louisiana with white farmers who would be assisted either by forced migrants, sort of like the people that David Manchin, who had a choice, come to Louisiana or you can be free, or you might get would be free if you got, came to Louisiana. A big part of that plan involved African slaves. They would come over here and they would work these new tobacco plantations that they hoped to create upriver from New Orleans and the Natchez area. They were not given the choice, come to uh, Louisiana or you could say in Africa. They were, according to French law, not slaves until they actually arrived in Louisiana. They were called captives. That was very interesting. The whole time they came from Africa, uh, going through that so-called door of no return, 
on the Mississippi, on the uh, Atlantic coast and the Gulf Coast. They were captives. Then when they got here, they became slaves. Well, by the time it began coming here, uh, late 17, 17, 18, 17, 19, Bienville defied Law's order to send them up river. Instead, he decided to keep them around New Orleans. They were not supposed to stay here. They were supposed to go further up river and help with these new tobacco plantations. And it was interesting because the acculturation of the first Africans, the Fulbe, the Mandingo, the Wolof, was by way of the Native Americans. And, and some of these Africans uh, who were distributed among the Indians to help grow food began to intermarry because most of the slaves that came over were men. Intermarried with Indian women began to have children. And their acculturation was not by way of the French. Their acculturation was basically by way of the Indians. It was not until Bienville was kicked out, he would come back, I always remind my students, come back for the last time, that the French Governor Perrier began to send Indians, at least began to send Africans upriver. And they began to be uprooted from their wives and their children. And that helped to precipitate the so-called Second Natchez War, where the Indians and the blacks got together and decided that they wouldn't get rid of the whites. Of course, they didn't win. But it did, in fact, uh, change Louisiana because it cut off the first slave trade. And it meant that most of the, the slaves who were already here uh, did not have nearly as much work to do as they had had before. The French who were left with a large slave population with not as much work to do, who were very fearful of waking up with their throats cut, decided that maybe we ought to do something to make the slaves feel a part of the society, not keep them apart from it, but make them feel a part of the society. And they almost transformed slavery into a milder form of servitude, where the slaves were recognized with some rights. Uh, they did, in fact, uh, have the right to leave the plantation and come back, no questions asked. They were able to do a little extra work for themselves. And that was very interesting. And that became one of these traditions that and do it even under the Spanish and even lasted under the, uh, the Americans. Some of you were lucky enough to have seen Solomon North, but this is one of the few little things that had survived where you could go out and uh, raise money and you keep it for yourself. But it was this first group in the uh, 1720s that would begin what I would call the creolization of, of Louisiana, where you have the Africans and the Indians and the Europeans beginning to interact and form an, a culture which would be made up of the contributions of three different groups. Yes, I think we can definitely say that the distinction here in Louisiana was the creolization. Um, what, what was it about the cultural mix here that allowed for that, more so than, let's say, the, the British colonies on the Atlantic seaboard? Um, how, how did this whole phenomenon come to be? Well, you know, creolization is the third rail of uh, anthropology and history, but um, I think that there were was, there was some things about Louisiana that we don't often turn over in our minds. And one of them is the death rate. Mm -hmm. You know, all those convicts, and by the way, a, you could be a convict in France if you sold salt without yeah. paying the king's tax. Right. So we have <clears throat> in our heads maybe an image of criminals, and they really, they weren't necessarily criminals. They were people who... Uh, who um, didn't, didn't, didn't go by the rules. But there were thousands of these convicts, and most of them died. Right. But there were 5,000 Africans enslaved here, almost 4,000 of them from Senegal, right. who lived. They survived. And so when we think about the cultural mix here, I think it's really important to be aware that this was the group that survived and had staying power and began to reproduce first um, before the Europeans did. So one of the reasons that I think we are so aware of um, African culture in this city, which is really the, sort of the, the engine of creolization, um, is because of that first generation that managed to survive, um, partly because they brought with them some immunity to malaria, um, partly because they were so valuable and, and um, were not worked to death on the tobacco plantations upriver. But I think that made a, an enormous difference um, to the process of creolization in the city. Um, and, then, and then lastly, um, 
you know, there were French cultural institutions were very weak um, here in New Orleans for the first 15 years or so. And so um, there, was, there was space for creolization to happen. I don't know much what I have to add to this. Uh, uh, I mean, I think one reason is the failure of the plantation, uh, plantation sector. I mean, they tried, John, I think, just John Law wanted to bring uh, small farmers, but he was also under orders to uh, turn this into a Chesapeake on the Mississippi. So they, they, they were going to, and they thought they could pull this off, uh, create a full-blown plantation society out of nothing overnight. Of course, that didn't work out. This was not a good place to, to grow tobacco except Perique in a certain strip of land on, in St. James Parish. So, uh, And they tried to grow indigo, but they couldn't compete with superior products from Guatemala, El Salvador, even South Carolina. And so the plantation economy here until the advent of sugar and later cotton, too, uh, was always hit and miss. And they had all these slaves on their hands, and they brought about 6,000 over, actually, yeah, total. Uh, yeah. total. And, and by, the, by, by 1731, I think there were about 4,000 left. So there was a, you know, not inconsiderable death rate there as well, you know, probably from uh, uh, pneumonia. And those, and, uh, but... Uh, that, that failure of the plantation economy and all the regimentation that that um, productive system entailed uh, created space for the African-American, uh, I should say the, the uh, Franco-African uh, slave community, uh, to, uh, uh, to carve out some autonomy for themselves. And I think Ralph's absolutely right that there was a great deal of of intermarriage and intermingling between the the African population and the African descended population and the Indian population, uh, despite the efforts of people like Perrier to drive a wedge between them by uh, having some, some of the first black militia go down river and slaughtered an unoffending community of Indians, but there was still that uh, that mixing and mingling. But I do think that. That, that the absent a, a plantation society, a repressive plantation society, and the flight of a lot of whites, uh, uh, whites from the colony, and they didn't have enough people to, to feed the colony and to build the, you know, the shelter. And they had to train somebody to do that, and they were African slaves. And, uh, and that's how I would partly explain, I think, what, what Emily and, uh, and Ralph uh, underscore is, you know, is, is unassailable, but I think the, the weakness of this economy created space for uh, the African descended population, which brought a lot of skills with them, by the way. They were not, uh, not just brawn, but they were carpenters and they, they were, you know, great watermen and a whole host of skills. And it allowed them to carve a space out for themselves and to begin to amass resources and to uh, uh, leave their imprint. I mean, this imprint on this, uh, this city, and which I think by the, by the 1740s, I think it's fair to say was practically a, uh, an African market town. Well, we know in 1763, um, the city was ceded over to the Spanish. And what, what, did, uh, what type of change did this usher? into the city. You want me to? Sure. You want to uh, well, it brought some order, a corporate identity. Uh, <laughs> it brought, uh, I mean, really, it, France governed this place from, with, from an indulgent distance. Uh, didn't put many resources into it. Uh, and that also, I think, allowed this, this uh, city to, uh, to develop in an interesting way. But the Spanish were, uh, when they took over, were in the, uh, in the early phases of uh, major imperial reform. And the, the king at the time, uh, Carlos III, was uh, a reformist king, and he wanted to bring order uh, and, uh, and, uh, and reorganize the imperial economy. 
Uh, and so they put real money into this place. Uh, there weren't that many uh, uh, Spaniards who came. It was mainly a governing and a military caste. Uh, and they were probably, you know, the second, second string of that uh, imperial uh, bureaucracy. Uh, but nonetheless, I think they governed pretty effectively. So that's one thing they did. And I know this subject will come up, and I don't want to dwell on it. But they also introduced a, a, um, uh, an important and a distinctive system of uh, race relations. Well, race relations is not quite the right word, but a new racial order. Uh, which I think was, was was extremely significant and important in the evolution of that tripartite racial order that uh, you still see uh, among us today. Do you want to follow up on that? Yeah, um, the Spanish also brought over most slaves, and what was significant about that was that most of the slaves who came. During the, late Span during the Spanish period, came from the same part of Africa where the first group came from. So it reinforced the cultural ties. That's one of the reasons why African survivors lasted much longer here, because you had a continuation of the African uh, cultural traits that had existed for, in Africa for hundreds of years. But the Spanish also, as Larry uh, pointed in that direction, introduced the Freedom Purchase, the Cortacion, which allowed slaves to purchase their own freedom. It was part of almost a contradictory policy that the Spanish law held that slavery was legal, but it was unnatural, that every creature had an inherent right to be free. So if you could legally gain freedom, then you were entitled to freedom. So the freedom purchase allowed a slave or somebody acting on his behalf to buy his freedom. So you could approach your master and say, how much would you take for my freedom? And if they could not agree, you could go before one of the local officials or even go before the uh, governing council, the cabildo or the governor. And what I found so interesting about that, the price was set based upon the value of that slave to date. You could not take into consideration how much the slave might earn over a working life, say maybe 20 or 25 years. Whatever that slave would sell on a market today, that would be the price. If you could come up with the money, the master could not refuse to sell you freedom. And it was very, very important when you had uh, cases where you had uh, slave fathers, for example, who might purchase the freedom of their wives, because if their wives were free, then their children became free. And this really helped to increase the free black population. I think it was estimated there were about 100 free blacks at the end of the French period. Uh, by the time the Louisiana purchase, there were several thousand. And it was not easy. In fact, I came across some interesting cases. There was a hassle between uh, Massa and the, uh, the mother was trying to get the price low, and uh, the, the Massa, of course, was trying to get as high a price as he could. And she was saying that her son was a thief. He didn't work hard, and he wasn't worth that kind of money. <laughs> well, <laughs> why would she try to get him free? Well, she's really trying to get the price down. And, and they hassled over that. And uh, they, I think they set it on 900 pesos, and I don't know what happened after he gained his freedom. But it was something that the Spaniards did that had not been done by the French. But many people think, in fact, of the old free black population of Louisiana going back to French people, French period. There were not that many. It's during the Spanish period that they were explored. And also, interesting enough, there was more interaction between Spanish men and African women. The Spaniards, as I mentioned, they were, not very many Spaniards came over. In fact, uh, a lot of the Spanish officials did not marry, but simply had concubines. And we know that it also included some of the priests. One of the most famous priests, Father Antoine, uh, had a family, a, a black family, a black mistress, and he had children. And he didn't hide it, as some people attempted to do. Um, can, we I, know can I dive oh, in? Of course, please, yes. Um, a couple of things. Um, some subtle things that we are just beginning to learn about in New Orleans after uh, the Spanish began to come in. And that is there were other groups that began to immigrate into yeah. New Orleans, uh, especially Anglophones. You know, yeah. we think of English speakers as arriving after the Louisiana Purchase, but that's not true. Um, as Larry said, the, the Spanish established some order. And that order attracted a number of people with commercial interests. Um, a lot of Irish um, who were involved in the Atlantic world. Um, a lot of Anglophones from Philadelphia who were already established um, as, as merchants in Saint-Domingue, which would later become Haiti. And a good many of them um, 
made their way to New Orleans. That was sort of the upper echelon, and I love to tell this story. Does anybody know who built, who the con contractor was for the Cabildo? It was Robert Jones, who was from Philadelphia, who was also a big merchant in Saint-Domingue. And so we're just beginning to uncover some of those lines and, and streams of migration. But those were, the, those were the hustlers and the entrepreneurs and sort of the elite. There were also a lot of little people um, who came <clears throat> to New Orleans. There were, of course, we know about the Canary Islanders, the Islenos. But they had their counterparts in Anglophones. And so one of the really fun things to do is to go and look at the sacramental records for St. Bernard Parish. Um, which was called Galvez in those days, and to find romances blossoming between Isleños and Anglophone girls who were the daughters of barkeepers or petty storekeepers in St. Bernard Parish. Um, so we don't think of English-speaking people being here very long before the purchase, but actually there was a pretty steady stream of them um, across the socioeconomic uh, spectrum. And I hope that as um, more and more graduate students from other parts of the country, that's another really important migration, by the way. Um, there are more and more PhD students from other parts of the country who've become interested in our city. And they're coming here and exploiting our wonderful archives and uncovering some of these things that we really hadn't known very much about before. You mentioned the Cajuns. Uh, well, and the Acadians as oh. well. They came during that period, too. Yeah. Brought in mainly by the Spanish right. that paid right. for it. Uh, um, I just wanted to make one, uh, add one thing that Ralph said uh, about the uh, the revival of the slave trade under the Spanish. And I didn't know that. I've always thought that the the main source of slaves under the Spanish came from the Congo, from West Central Africa. I mean, I knew there were some from Senegal, but I. What's very interesting about the Spanish period is that you have slaves from a new ethnic group uh, now encountering a creolized uh, slave community, and we're still trying to wrap our minds around what that meant. But, but uh, I, I think it's important to, uh, to keep in mind the, the Congo uh, influx, because I think they brought a certain rhythmic tradition that Ned Sublet talks about uh, that... that uh, uh, interwove with the with the melismatic, the melodic traditions of uh, Senegambia. and Gambia. Well, before we leave the uh, Spanish period, I think it's important to note that in 1768, uh, there was, of course, a clash between the uh, French Creoles and the new Spanish government, uh, and an attempted coup uh, at the time. I know you wrote about that in your book, Larry. What, what exactly was leading to that? It wouldn't be the first time that uh, two groups would clash here. Well, I think a, a group I call the Bienvolists, who had it their own way, kind of the people who had uh, were related to Bienville, related to Le Moines, uh, and had uh, come to power and had come to dominate the economy during the, Sp the French period, basically overplayed their hand. Uh, and uh, I think they thought they could uh, pull this off without thinking very clearly about it. And then when they realized that the Spanish were not going to let them get away with this, they said, oh, my God, it was one of these WTF moments for them. <laughs> uh, it, it's, uh, I, I, treat it, I try to write about it with uh, some wry irony. But, we, you know, we celebrate this as the first, uh, first attempt at a colonial revolt, a col colonial liberation movement, but it, it seemed to me merely a an effort by a group of insiders who are afraid of, of their uh, illicit trading uh, networks being closed down by the Spanish, trying to return sovereignty to the, to the French so they could have the same free, free hand to uh, conduct affairs any way they, they saw fit. Well, we'll leap ahead uh, to really one of the most pivotal moments in Louisiana history. Of course, that was the Louisiana Purchase of 1803. And, you know, I've, I've often found it um, amusing when I'm, I'm giving out-of-towners tours of this city uh, to explain that uh, Les Americans were, were foreigners uh, when they arrived here and that there was uh, very much a cultural clash uh, 
between the established French and Spanish Creole society and these uh, new arrivals, uh, particularly with uh, the new American governor, William C.C. C. Claiborne, and I hope, I hope we can elaborate on him. But what were the major differences uh, between these cultures? I have to leave then. Because I think we have to get rid of this story. I'm not persuaded. Um, when I look at the relations between English speakers and French speakers and Spanish speakers around the time of the Louisiana Purchase, I see an awful lot of uh, collusion, um, especially in the business area. I see a lot of intermarriage. I see a lot of being godparents to each other. They're all going, their daughters are all going to school together at the Ursuline Convent. So I think to some degree we read back. I mean, Claiborne was nervous. Mm -hmm. He definitely was nervous. But if we lay Claiborne aside for a minute and look at what people were actually doing, ordinary people actually doing, um, they, they were mixing a lot more than you might think. And, and, you know, remember, there were a lot of English speakers here before the Louisiana Purchase. So it wasn't new. So I think what changes actually changes a little, quite a bit after the Louisiana Purchase, when the economy here really takes off and you get a flood of mostly single bachelor um, English-speaking men who um, really are a different force from the group that arrived just after the Louisiana Purchase. And, and birds of passage, exactly. So that really had a, a, a very different impact on the city. And Larry just said these, these bachelors who came down were birds of passage. And they were. And so it, they were perceived very differently by the permanent population here from English speakers who had been coming and doing business here for a really long time. What do you mean by birds of passage? Um, these were single men who came down to make a fortune. Transient. They were they were very they were transient. They were very much like French speaking men who went to Saint Domingue for the same reason. It was it was a boom town, you know, think San Francisco in Gold 1849. Yeah. They were looking for fortunes, they were coming down and if things didn't work out, they left again. They often left illegitimate children behind. So um, again, I think we're just beginning to understand the difference between this earlier migration of English speakers and the and the um, the territorial officials and this really flood of uh, of bachelor English speaking men coming to New Orleans to seek their fortunes. Well, Larry, I know in your book, uh, I read that there were even near riots that would break out at public ballrooms. Uh, between the Americans uh, and, the, and the French Creoles. And I thought, I thought that was very interesting because now, of course, there are also great debates about music uh, and, its, and the effect on quality of life in the city. But uh, I, I wanted to hear your thoughts on that. Well, I mean, I, I think um, Emily's right to kind of tone it down. Um, and I guess I thought there were two. Maybe there were two. Uh, I know about one. And I think probably uh, those, those riots were probably between American troops and French troops, to tell you the truth, or Spanish troops. But there were real clashes, and, and uh, they were eventually uh, ironed out. It was mainly in the area of the law, because you're trying to mesh together two legal systems, the civilian law tradition and the common law tradition. And that created a, quite a bit of, of uh, sturm und drang. Uh, but I think Emily's right. I think I'm struck with how, how at least at the, the level of the elites, I didn't realize about the, you know, the subaltern population that there was this, uh, this intermarriage taking place, these uh, uh, romances developing and blossoming. Uh, but you certainly see it at, at, among the elite. I mean, for example, Claiborne, Claiborne is one. He married twice. Uh, his first wife he brought down with her died of yellow fever and then he married a Creole woman and she died and he married another Creole woman. But I mean all of them who came down here, Edward Livingston, uh, uh, John Brown from Kentucky, uh, Henry Clay's brother and his son, they may be all married into the Creole community and it became quite a network between Kentucky and, and, and New Orleans and southern Louisiana. Uh, but I do think this this deep division uh, between the Creole and the Americans uh, really did start to uh, harden and, and become more embittered 
when the economy began to take off. And boy, did it take off here. Um, Raphael, where, where did free people of color fit into the uh, arrival of the Americans? You mean after the, the purchase? Yes. yes. Uh, first of all, their numbers were greatly increased with the arrival of the refugees from the islands. Large numbers came from the uh, rebellion at, at what's now Haiti, the San Dominican route. But it's interesting because uh, we have this myth about the three class and how very well the free people of color were treated. That's more of a myth during the American period because <clears throat> the Americans, of course, were not used to uh, blacks being anything but a sub sub subjugated group, even if they were free blacks. And while there had, in fact, been the Jean de Couleur liberals and the free blacks and the vast majority of blacks who were slaves, it's during the American period, in fact, even before statehood, that the Americans, with some exceptions from the Creoles, almost continually suppress rights for blacks. For example, under the old policy, slave families were generally sold in lots, family lots. And you could not separate children from their parents before the age of 14. Now, part of the reason for that was there wasn't that great domain for slaves until the end of the Spanish period when they started growing sugar. But the, uh, the French society also recognized slave marriages as being legal. If a man was married to a slave, that was his wife. The American law did not recognize that. And so you, you found that almost continually from the time that the Americans came in up until the beginning of the American Civil War, there, is, there are attacks on the privileges. There were very few rights that the uh, free blacks had. So even though that you had free blacks, for example, who may have been economically well off and certainly may have been educated, what is interesting is they fought to vindicate their rights. They were being punished. And in fact, there's an interesting uh, discovery. The free black population goes down very significantly between 1840 and 1860. Uh, a lot of blacks like Edmund Dede, the uh, French uh, conductor, they left because they found society much more restrictive. So I, I think, again, sometimes we look back and say, well, gee, this was a very good time. But in fact, you found the free blacks were almost continually protesting against the loss of rights. And I, I often had mentioned to my class that if the whites had been smart enough to cultivate a separate class of blacks to serve sort of as a bulwark between the uh, whites and the slaves, they may have been successful, but they almost always treated free blacks as blacks. That was the, the key word, not the fact that they were free. Uh, if you were free black, if you were a slave, you could not write on the street cause. You were black. And I think in, uh, that if uh, they had allowed uh, blacks more privileges, for example, give them more restrictive rights, then you would not have had the melding, eventually, of the two classes into what I call one race. There's one, one other point I want to uh, make that we didn't talk about, how important religion was in Louisiana. And the fact that the Franks did not allow, officially, even though they were people, as Emily mentioned, there were some Americans who came in who were Protestants. They did not officially allow non-Catholics to Louisiana. So Paul Revere's family is French. They were Huguenots. They wound up in Massachusetts. Uh, John Jay, who was the first Chief Justice of the United States, his family was uh, French Huguenot. They wound up in New York. The Frenos, they were French Huguenots. They wound up in South Carolina. And so religion did, in fact, play a role at, at first. In fact, most of the Americans who came in, the, the Protestants, even though they, they, they were the ones who were strangers, they referred to the French as the strangers because they were different from their culture. The, the free blacks uh, who were here uh, were very prosperous on the one hand, but at the same time, they were always fighting to try to hold on to remaining rights. I, I remember a friend of mine coming back from uh, Cape Town, South Africa in the 1980s. He talked about how extremely well off there were some blacks, but they didn't have any rights. And this is what you found of the, the, the free black population. They were people who were recorded some privileges, but nothing like the, the rights that were enjoyed by whites. <clears throat> uh, how that contributed to the formation of this class of people, the free people of color, also the martial skills that were accorded them. 
Well, you know, they had two big fires here that practically raised the city, and one in 1788, and another one in 1794. Uh, the Spanish rebuilt the city, but who was going to do the building? Uh, often slave artisans, or they were very much part of that workforce. And it was the custom of, of planners to allow their slaves, uh, especially skilled slaves, to hire out their time and the understanding that they would share some of those earnings with their, uh, with the masters. What that meant is that a lot of, of slaves were able to squirrel away a lot of, of savings, uh, either in their mattresses or wherever they were going to stuff it. And, and, and they had been doing this for quite a while. So when this more liberal manumission regime took effect, uh, they had the resources uh, to bargain for their freedom, or if not their freedom, the freedom of their children. And often women did that. Mm -hmm. um, the martial tradition, uh, it begins under the French, but it doesn't really become, that it's, it's a free black militia, it really doesn't become institutionalized uh, until the Spanish period. And when you had, at the end of the Spanish period, you had four, isn't that right, four, four, four battalions. Two of them, uh, Pardo, that is uh, uh, light-skinned, mixed race, and uh, two Marino. I believe that's right. I have to go back and look at my, my book. Uh, and this was a case where the, you know, the Spanish knew they would, and they think the, the rationale was, I believe, you know, they just had gone through a, a, a uprising on the part of the, of the French elite, the Creole elite. And I think they wanted to have an ace in the hole in case this happened again. Uh, but there was also a tradition of, of free black militia in the Spanish Empire. And it was a well-respected tradition. And uh, uh, they're, they're not, they weren't going to abolish it easily. In fact, every time the, 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 local, the local elite tried to pressure the Spanish to, uh, to abolish these uh, militia, the governors to a man, dug in. Dr. Cosimir uh, briefly touched on the Haitian Revolution and the effect it had on New Orleans. Uh, thousands of refugees from that Caribbean island flooded into New Orleans, and as I understand it, the city actually doubled in size uh, from their arrival. Uh, Emily, I know in your book, uh, American Quadroon, you've, you've done quite a bit of research on that. What effect did that have on New Orleans? Is the air conditioning on you? <laughs> <laughs> It's getting hot. It's just, uh, it was huge. You know, first of all, I want you to imagine what it must have been like in this city. They didn't have any warning that this was going to happen. Um, the um, Haitian settlers were in Cuba, in the eastern part of Cuba, and in the late spring of uh, 1809, they were evicted. They were rounded up and told they had to get on boats. The evacuation wasn't organized. Some of us are old enough to remember the ragtag flotilla of Cubans. This was the first ragtag flotilla. Um, the first Cuban boat lift. Just all kinds of boats, all shapes, all sizes. Um, the captains of these vessels were doing it privately and charging whatever they could get out of these refugees who were being forced out. And you can read in Claiborne's letters, he doesn't know it's coming. He hears from the people at the mouth of the river, thousands of these refugees are beginning to come. And he tries to control it by just allowing a few to come at a time, but it's hopeless. So in the space of just a few months, the population of the city doubled. Just think about that. And the population of free people of color tripled. And most of those free people of color were women and children. And so one of the things that I talk about in my book is um, to think about that community, that group of women and children, and what they faced when they ended up in New Orleans without their men who were prohibited from coming to Louisiana. They were not allowed to come in because there was a fear that if they allowed adult males of Haitian origin to come in, they would start a Haitian revolution Redux, version two, in Louisiana. And so these women and children arrived in New Orleans with very few resources. Um, and this is the time when we begin to see people talking about 
um, free women of color as the concubines of white men. And I really hate that term. Um, but this is when that whole conversation begins. It begins to appear in newspapers. Visitors to the city begin to see it. And one of the things that I've discovered in, um, in researching this era, which was a really turbulent time in New Orleans, is that there were really two communities of free people of color in New Orleans about that time, 1809. There were the people who had been born here, whose parents had been born here. Their parents were mostly married by this time. Um, and then there were the refugees who were coming in and making things much more difficult for the free people of color who were already having a difficult time. Um, because now there was this huge population and people were beginning to lump together the two groups in their minds, um, which, which was made things really difficult for the Orleanian free people of color. So that influx was huge in terms of not just the population, but in terms of the way people thought about New Orleans. So if you were one of those bachelor men who was coming down from Philadelphia or Baltimore or New York, in 1809, 1810, you hired one of these Haitian refugee women to be your housekeeper. And she was often a housekeeper with benefits. And we see, you know, a tragedy unfolding in the sacramental records with Haitian refugee women bearing children, more children than Orleanian free women of color, often to men with names like Lowell of Massachusetts, Clay of Kentucky. Um, so we get a picture of a time in our city that was not a pretty time, but one that has really left an imprint on the way other people imagine us to be. And that has been a memory that has really lingered, for better or worse, for a very long time. Um, the half century that followed the Louisiana Purchase uh, through the years prior to the Civil War uh, were ones of major expansion for the city and likely among its most prosperous uh, times ever. Uh, the city became the port of entry for scores of immigrants from Europe, the Caribbean, South America. Uh, slavery, of course, grew at a rapid pace. Um, what, what drew uh, people from such far-flung places uh, to New Orleans? Uh, why, why did it become so, the supposed Ellis Island of the South? Uh, well, this period was probably witnessed the heaviest immigration into the United States proportionately. It at least uh, uh, represented about 15% of the host or receiving population, so it was major. In a city like New Orleans, which was one of two major entrepots, um, New York being number one, we were number two, and about two million people passed through here. Of course, not two million stayed. Uh, the impact was dramatic, uh, even more dramatic than the that earlier Haitian influx. Uh, I was looking at a data that that Rich Campanella put together. I went went to the to the census online census today, but that had been shut down because of the government. <laughs> shut down. Uh. So. When the government's not up and running, you can count on Rich being up and running. <laughs> uh, you know, he has one, this is as of 1850. I mean, this was clearly uh, the first melting pot city. And I'll come back and answer your question, but I just want to get this, this fact out. Uh, more so than any other major city. I think Rich said it was had more significantly sized ethnic communities than any other major city in the country. And the work he, he's, the statistical work he's done certainly bears it out. But as of 1850, only 29% of the white population in New Orleans was locally born. Uh, and probably most of the, of the foreigners, or the, the strangers, were uh, not Americans, but were German or Irish or French, because there was a continuing influx of French people coming in, and also from the islands. Uh, now, why did they come here? Well, this, from 1810, 1815 to about 1850 or so, even 1860, I mean, this was a new Calcutta of cotton and slavery, and a lot of money was changing hands here very quickly. 
And if any of you who are in finance knows if you want to make a lot of money, go to some place where money's changing hands quickly because they're make, they're creating money. And this was became the the folk the fulcrum on which the whole cotton economy uh, pivoted. And this was at a time when cotton was like oil during the OPEC height of the OPEC period. This is what it was was fueling uh, the first industrial revolution, the textile revolution. And lots and lots of money were, was made here. And Louisiana, as a matter of fact, had the highest second pe per capita income in the country and more millionaires per capita than anywhere else. And a lot of them were based here in New Orleans. Uh, it was a center of financial exchange. Uh, it, was, it was really quite extraordinary. It was the biggest slave mart in the country. Uh, and the, it was the fastest growing city between 1812 and 1840. In fact, I think in 1840 it was the fourth largest city. So it had come from being a backwater of empire almost overnight into, as I say, this kind of new Calcutta of cotton and sugar and, uh, and slavery. Uh, and of course, if you're going to build an economy, you're going to need folks to help you do it. One reason I think uh, the, the, the community of Jean de Couleur Libre uh, the free people of color uh, were able to consolidate their position here is because they were the urban middle class. They had a lot of the skills that built the city, the Masons, for example. Uh, and so that's one reason. And another reason, there were, there were push factors, you know, the, the, the uh, potato famine in Ireland uh, or the revolutions of 1848 in Germany, which, which pushed a lot of people out of those countries. Uh, but that's uh, basically the answer. But I wanted to make the point that that almost overnight this city grew into you know a, a, a major metropolis. I mean Chicago was was hardly anything at this time. It was it, it, its real growth period comes after the Civil War. Uh, it was New Orleans, and everyone thought New Orleans was going to surpass New York. And in terms of some of the tonnage of exports, it did. Uh, and it was, I think, well, I don't think, uh, I think it's safe to say, the first melting pot city, the most multicultural city. And I think, I'll come back to Rich again, he's the most multicultural city, uh, extraordinarily multicultural, cultural at an extraordinarily early time. And I think I paraphr I hope I paraphrase you correctly. <laughs> and uh, I kind of knew this, but I was, it was reassuring to see that, that Rich went in and looked at this, this, in, this data with, I think, clean hands without any preconceptions. Um, and, you know, and what strikes me here is that, perhaps unlike New York, it seemed that the ethnicities blended more, that there was more, to some degree, I guess, a comfort level uh, between these ethnic groups. Was that true? Well, it depends how you slice it. Uh, I think people had to coexist here. I mean, they couldn't retreat into their separate enclaves. And by the way, there were no purely ethnic enclaves here. The Irish Channel was not purely Irish. Right. There was a lot of but Germans. Uh, Little Saxony had, was not all uh, Germany, uh, German. Um, the, the French Quarter was extraordinarily mixed. Um, um, and people had, you know, they had, they, they had to... Uh, hug that natural levy. They couldn't go back to town. Uh, and they really couldn't escape one another. I mean, if you go through the census, you could see, uh, and I think, Rich, you did, you did this as well, you could see almost every other house had somebody of a different ethnic or racial uh, ancestry living there. I just want to add this, because I was talking to somebody I mentioned that I felt much safer in New York City than I do in uh, New Orleans. But I don't find police in New York nearly as friendly as police in New Orleans. And I don't know if that's a contradiction. <laughs> <laughs> well, or, Thank you. 
I guess it could mean anything you want it to mean, but originally it meant local or native, even before it was introduced here in Louisiana. My grandma always referred to herself as Creole. I, didn't, I never heard her say she was a Creole. And I think she was talking about her culture. Well, we're going to open up the floor to uh, questions. Is there anything any of you wanted to, um, to add before we, uh, before we go to that? Okay. I'm just like anyone that does want to ask a question to come to the microphone and do it so that we get it on the recording. Thank you. Outstanding panel. So this is a question for the whole panel. Dr. Kashmir, you raised a very good uh, point, and also Dr. Powell, you wrote about it in your book. And you were saying that the Spanish had a different take on slavery than the French. Has anyone ever given any thought to maybe a tangential effect of what the Moors might have done in Spain in terms of how they perceive people in one sense as opposed to, say, the, the English or, say, the Dutch or the Portuguese or anyone else? I'm going to take that because I'm actually teaching a class tomorrow on the construction of race. And I've just uh, finished an article called The Iberian Roots of Racism. So um, what this article talks about is how um, I, Muslim Spain, which was connected to uh, a huge expanse of Muslim-controlled Mediterranean and Middle East, um, began uh, importing captives to become slaves um, all over the Muslim world, and Spain was part of that. And they had enslaved people, slaves from all over. The word slave comes from Slav. A lot of them came from around the Black Sea in the Caucasus. But they also imported uh, sub-Saharan Africans into all of these places, including Muslim Spain, as early as the ninth century. And what the author of this article says is that if you look at what these, uh, they were called Zanzi, what the Zanzi did, they did all the most menial jobs um, that there were in the Dar el-Islam, particularly in Iberia, which later became Spain. So I think, I don't think um, Spain was less racist. Um, if this article is right, and I think it has some very good points, it was perhaps the origin of racism when it comes to sub-Saharan Africans. But what differentiated Spain was its law, which recognized all people as potentially as Christians, mm -hmm. um, people with souls, mm -hmm. who therefore had to be given the capacity for freedom. Right. And there was, no, um, there was no parallel thinking in English common law or indeed in English religion. You know, in, in Protestantism at that time, you were either damned or saved when you were born. Right. And so there was no incentive to convert captives to Catholicism. It was a completely different mindset um, in terms of how you thought of enslaved people. So I think if anything, it, was, it, it goes back to religion and to law that came out of religion. And actually the, the, the law that sort of made a space for coartacion goes all the way back to the 12th century. So it's a very, very old law. It's just that it took on, it, it had a very new, unique effect when that law was, um, was practiced and, and popped up, um, not just in New Orleans, but all over the Western Hemisphere. <laughs> Hi there. I just uh, <clears throat> want to thank uh, everybody involved in putting on this fascinating panel. And uh, I just want to ask if somebody could uh, maybe touch on or characterize the uh, uh, earliest arrivals of Jewish people uh, in, in New Orleans, in that community. Okay. Well, uh, in the colonial period, there weren't many. Uh, uh, the French, uh, I think the Code Noir of, of 1725, Article 1, uh, banned them from settling here, and I think the Spanish had that same, took that same stance, although there were, uh, there were here, Monsanto family for one was probably the most prominent. But it really wasn't until uh, 
probably the 1820s, 30s, 40s, that you began to see a, a significant Jewish immigration into New Orleans, uh, mainly, mainly German or from Alsace, and French, and from Al Alsace-Lorraine, for example. Um, and they assimilated pretty, uh, pretty quickly. Uh, in fact, they too married into the Creole aristocracy, uh, Judah P. Benjamin right. being a perfect example of that. Uh, probably one of the smartest uh, lawyers ever to uh, practice in Louisiana. He was a brilliant man. Um, interestingly, there wasn't a heavy influx from Eastern Europe because the, the German Jewish reform, highly assimilated popular community here, wanted to keep them out. Uh, they were afraid that bringing in, bringing in Jews who were uh, very traditional, very, uh, you know, practiced, uh, very orthodox, uh, uh, you know, uh, observed, uh, observed uh, Jewish ritual and were not a, a embarrassed to show it, uh, might upset the, the apple cart. And this was at a time when anti-Semitism, we're talking about the late 19th century, uh, was beginning to... Uh, 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 become more virulent. This is when, uh, you know, they, the idea took hold that Jews could not be gentlemen, so they're kept out of the colleges. And I think they were afraid of, of, of stirring that up. Uh, it happened anyway, because that's when, when Carnival became more, uh, more exclusive and anti-Semitic. But uh, the other thing interesting about the Jewish community here, given the size of the city, it was never that large, you know, to say as compared to uh, New York or Cincinnati, I mean, proportionately speaking. But it's been a very influential community in, in many ways. Just two very brief follow-up questions for clarification. Um, Emily, for, uh, first, uh, the, uh, the uh, relationships between the women Free women of color that you describe in the very early part of the 19th century is is that plissage or is that predate the practice of plissage? Oh, how long do you have? <laughs> first of all, I said the question was short. Yeah, okay. it was a short question. But um, first of all, let me say that just the term plissage was not used at that time. It's a 20th century introduction into the history of New Orleans. Really? Um, it's what um, relationships, non-marital, but permanent relationships between two people in 20th century Haiti and probably 19th century Haiti was called. And so uh, it, the, it got applied to people in New Orleans by the great black sociologist E. Franklin Frazier, who was a friend of Melville Herskovitz, who wrote a book on rural Haiti and introduced the term plissage into um, the English vocabulary. So uh, the first thing I want to say is that I, I have problems with just that word because it brings up a whole sort of bundle of practices, some of which happened and many of which didn't. You know, this notion of a contract and mother's brokering. Um, Let me just interject in case people don't know what we're referring to. Okay. My understanding was, which Emily is responding to, is that the octoroon balls, for example, were really occasions in which as young Creole women of color came of age, they were brokered by their families for relationships with, as mistresses, in effect, of um, wealthy white men, um, and that these often became uh, long-term relationships, often buying them houses in Treme or Marigny uh, in order to sustain them, and um, a corollary, corollary of it is our forced inheritance uh, laws in order to protect the property rights of the white families in the event that the affections were alienated to the families of color. So that was sort of the... So that comes in 1808. So just to separate out the, the myth from the reality, I've never, I've spent a lot of time in the notarial archives. I've never found a contract. Um, and um, the, the quadroon balls were actually um, an innovation introduced to New Orleans in 1805 by guess who? 
a Haitian refugee. And so when we're trying to understand where this history quasi-myth of free women of color in New Orleans comes from, the key really is Haiti. Um, there were relationships, usually life partnerships, between free women of color and European-descended men in New Orleans um, in the late colonial period. Those really died out um, by the turn of the century, and the free black population was marrying each other, and it became really um, sort of not acceptable if you were from one of those families not to get married. So the custom among Orleanians of those life partnerships that were across the color line began to die out. It resurged with the Haitian refugee influx for the reasons I tried to explain. And interestingly, I think that the whole notion of a contract came from Haiti, where there were contracts between free women of color and men, both black and white, who hired them to be their house managers. Uh, not necessarily mistresses. Um, we assume that they were mistresses, but not all of them were. And they, um, they had contracts that were drawn up at a notary's office with pay and benefits, including medical benefits. Um, and some of them turned into sexual partnerships, but many of them didn't. Um, so the, the historians that have begun to work on the vast notarial records of Saint-Domingue, which is pre-revolutionary Haiti, are telling us more and more about the roots of, of our own culture here and where those stories come from. And Larry, also a brief question, perhaps bringing on a longer answer. Um, just a, a clarification about Sephardic Jews and when the Benjamin, Delgado, Moses, Toros, uh, arrived uh, in what period? Because didn't we also have the second oldest synagogue in the United yeah. States uh, here? Well, I, I think they, uh, Toro must have come, I want to say around the, uh, the territorial period. He came pretty early. He's one of the first, I want to say 1810, 18-teens. Uh, you, you catch me uh, a little off guard. I, I can't... I can't date it, but I, I, I should have mentioned the Sephardic community. It was a pretty significant one as well. Uh, yeah, yeah. No, not really. I don't think many arrived during that period. Monsana was here, but he was expelled and he came back. Uh, but it's not until... Uh, it's not until the American period when this this, this became a, a booming economy. I wanted to ask if free people of color and free women of color could vote, could they hold office? No. So they could not participate politically in their in their culture? No. Until after the, in fact, until it after the Civil War. Became until after the very, Civil War. Very, very restrictive in, I think, 18... 53, the legislature banned any more emancipations. And then two years later, amended the law to allow free blacks to voluntarily re-enslave themselves and they could pick their own master. Mm -hmm. I thought that was a joke, but we had a student to do mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. a master thesis and we found seven or eight cases. Now, I think probably what it was because uh, as you near the pre-Civil War period, it was a form of protection against kidnapping that if you had somebody who was sort of your legal guardian uh, who could reclaim you if you were uh, somehow another snatched into slavery. The danger, as somebody mentioned, we had this um, false airship. So, you know, you had a friend who said that he was legally your master. If he died, you passed on to his heirs. Mm -hmm. But we had, I, I thought it was a joke when I, when I found it, uh, when I first read it, but we had a student who did a thesis and found about seven or eight cases where free blacks did, in fact, go into court, execute affidavits indicating that they were going back into slavery. But I think it probably was protective custody. So free just meant freedom from servitude. Yes. Period. You could not be sold unless, again, you were condemned back into slavery. No vote, no, no participation. Thank you. Ralph, can I ask you a question? Mm -hmm. uh, I've always been uh, puzzled over the dramatic decline 
of the free black population between 1840 and 1860. And if you factor in natural increase, what that population, uh, what, the, what its, its size would have been had uh, there not been this, this shrinkage, I would estimate like 50 or 60 percent uh, of that population disappeared. But I, I've not seen proof uh, in any, any strong evidence that they all left the, the city. I mean, you have the, the, you know, the uh, examples of Day Day, uh, for example. And, <coughs> but what happened to them? I mean, what's your... Well, I mean, that's what the conjecture that some of them may have gone to places like Mexico or gone Veracruz, to other places, yeah. or European cities. But that's a lot of people. Yeah. And I don't know if there's that evidence that that many of them, you know, cross... Yeah, go ahead. It's, we've talked about this, Larry, and... and um, you know, you were the one who first got me thinking about how some of them, as a strategy, may have managed to get themselves identified as white in the census. And um, I have now gotten to know more families than I can count on all my hands and toes um, times 10 um, in New Orleans, free families of color. And some of them did, although the, the majority of them did so in, in the 1860 census. But you can <clears throat> see some of this population um, being reassigned, racially reassigned, um, especially from, from 1850 on. So I think your initial instinct was about that was right, Larry. I think that was one of the strategies. But certainly immigration was another one. Um, there were these colonies down in Mexico um, that took a, a large number of people um, and and the other thing that we're learning is that a lot of people went back to Haiti. To Haiti. Yeah. A lot of people went back to Haiti. Hi, I was wondering if you could um, touch upon what impact the great influx of the various immigrants, starting with the Haitians and then the, the white Northern European groups, on the um, physical uh, aspects of the city, the architecture and the urban design. What impact did the influx of foreigners and blacks have on the impact in the city? I think in terms of architecture, James Gallier was one of these outsiders who the came material in. material fabric. <clears throat> well, there was a much bigger market, for one thing. And so, um, architects. so architects and builders especially, and I think Larry probably mentioned before, and, and Ralph as well, that a lot of free people of color were in the building trades. Um, and so um, I think the immigrants influenced it not so much in terms of bringing different, um, a different vocabulary of architecture to the city as much as they did fuel just incredible expansion. We all know about Treme, also the Marigny. Um, I was surprised when I started looking into where the Haitian refugees ended up at how many of them ended up in Faubourg St. Marie, right. which we think of as the American right. sector. Right. Right. So the whole city is really um, expanding because of that immigration. And I'm sure that you know, the evolution of the shotgun house and, and other, especially domestic architecture, because I think that's where it would be most visible. Um, I think the evolution of that kind of vernacular architecture was was um, accelerated by this huge um, antebellum influx of immigrants from all over. Well, I mean, the Irish, of course, brought a lot of brawn, <laughs> and they dug the canals, and they died in droves from the yellow fever epidemics that would pummel New Orleans with frightening regularity. Uh, the Germans got control of the brewery business <laughs> pretty quickly. And the bakeries. And the bakeries, and also uh, the music business, Whirlides, for example. Um, Churches. Churches. Uh, many, many more churches. Uh, national churches. National churches, and some of them right across the street from one another, St. Mary's of Assumption and uh, South St. Alphonsus. But you've got me there on the, the vernacular architecture. I'm, I don't have an answer for it. Thanks for the question. <laughs> okay, I think, I think we'll wrap it up with that. I want to thank all of our panelists. Uh, this was just an incredible amount of knowledge to absorb tonight. And, um, <laughs>
sign for the utility bill for the air conditioning. I'm certain we've set the stage for our future conversations. The next one will cover the civil.